Yeah. Um, to be honest, I actually came here to learn about autonomy mechanics to somehow find out where the whole field is going, and I was a little bit surprised to find myself now as the first speaker in the session on big vision. But I think that the point at the moment, and this is what I'm really interested in, is that somehow this optomechanics shares a lot of similarities with some our development that we've seen in quantum optics maybe 10 or 15 years ago. You know, I still remember the days when people were very excited about having single trapped iron laser pulled into the ground state and all of these things. And then what came afterwards was you know, ideas about entanglement engineering. So the whole thing, all of these tools were available. And then you know, one tried to do something that was sort of you know, bigger than the interest in the, in the problem in itself to so find applications. And I guess that in optonanomechanics, mechanics, uh, you know, having achieved cooling uh, to a good degree, uh, one is at the point where one is asking sort of, say, what's next and what's the big vision and can this whole thing make a bigger impact? And as I said, my hope here was to come here and actually learn about these things and uh, to not be the first one to actually talk about that. But let me, uh, you know, so let me first of all uh, give you a brief summary in my talk here by telling you, you know, a few ideas that we have worked on in the past and then pick out one particular topic. And on Friday I received an email from, uh, from Peter Rable and Misha Luki that I should actually speak on the optomechanical transducer for quantum networks. And so I will take the opportunity to say a few words about, you know, the old story of atoms and cavities and quantum networks, the big vision. Uh, that maybe never really materialized with single atoms in the way that we hoped that it would do, but where maybe with optonano mechanics there is something that uh, maybe at the very end uh, a better way of doing these things and more realistic. And I guess this could be one of these, so to say, applications or ideas. But before I, I enter this thing, let me, uh, you know, first of all, say that I've enjoyed a lot of collaborations here with many of these people. I've mentioned groups and so on on the way. I didn't even write down collaborators because there are too many. Here. On the Neinsburg side, I would like to mention really three people in particular, Clement Kamera, who now moved on to Hannover, Peter Rabel, who came back from Harvard uh, to us, and he's sort of the senior group leader, now at home in nanomechanics, and uh, he is the one that really, so to say, heads the subgroup. And uh, we have a PhD student, Kai Stanek, who is uh, measured with this guy. So here is sort of uh, an old project. And let me sort of, you know, say a few words about these things. These are papers that we wrote in the last few years that, uh, you know, um, most of these things have not been done in the experiment yet, but they sort of, you know, try to ask to somehow connect optonano mechanics to a broader picture. Uh, so uh, the first paper that we wrote some time ago, you know, together uh, with Eugene Polsik and Markus Astermeyer, was the question that something that has been copied from Eugene Polsik before it probably comes on, which I guess that all of you know these great experiments that Eugene is doing where he has two atomic ensembles being close to um, uh, continuous variable quantum states in them. And then at the end, he you know, has ideas to develop together with Ignacio, for example, on uh, establishing EPR correlations. And it turns out, of course, that you know, having cavity in an oscillator over here, that's obviously a continuous variable system, and uh, atoms can be a continuous variable system by encoding in the spin. Similar things can be asked here. And so we wrote a paper that, so to say, tries to talk about interfaces between optonano mechanics and then uh, the, the uh, Coding that we have in the atomic ensemble over here based on measurement. It's kind of a copy of the old ideas, but it's actually quite amazing that all of the numbers seem to work out. And I guess that this would be a great way to experimentally realize these interfaces along these lines. You know, uh, another challenge that we did together with the Caltech people uh, was to ask the question to what extent we can actually have a membrane with a nanomechanical oscillator and using a high Q cavity, to what extent can we achieve strong coupling? the motion of an atom inside of an optical lattice, which is inside of a cavity, and then to a membrane. Again, this belongs to this class of interfaces where the bottom line of the whole story is always, you know, can you make a coherent coupling over here, enhanced by the cavity, which at the very end is uh, larger than all of the dissipation which is going on. I think that these ideas are very challenging, and it's sort of, you know, there's a lot of, of work, of course, on, uh, there's, there's a lot of work, of course, on coupling, for example, single spins and, and single atoms uh, to a membrane, but usually this is done by direct coupling. Here the question was how to do these things mediated by cavity. And uh, uh, Jeff Kimball in this lab is uh, trying to do maybe eventually experiments uh, along these lines. And 
finally, there's the last uh, idea down here that I personally like a lot uh, because I sort of see applications over here in a broader context, and I will talk about these things uh, at the very end of my talk here today, uh, which is the story of, of optical lattices coupled to nanomechanical oscillators. I guess that all of you are aware of these uh, great things that have been done with optical lattices, making Hubbard models, but of course, earlier in the days of, of the laser cooling inside of an optical lattice, you know that you take uh, an uh, atomic ensemble here, put it inside of a lattice, there will be motion of these particles. And the question is, you know, if you can get in free space, this is not enhanced by the cavity. So over here, things are sort of visible a little bit more obvious. To what extent you can get in free space by having a large number of atoms, Nonetheless, to get a coherent coupling between, for example, the motion of the nanomechanical oscillator and something outside here. So you can see all of these things that are over here are sort of interfaces between nanomechanics and, and atoms, where, of course, the bigger picture is that many things that we know how to do with atoms really well, you know, cannot be done on the side of, of the nanomechanics and vice versa, but lights, uh, the light provides the way how the two systems actually talk to each other, and the challenge is to uh, get quantum correlations here and also have very against interactions that are larger than any of the dissipation things over here. So I'll discuss these things afterwards, not so much here from the point of view of uh, you know telling you what can be done, because uh, experiments by, for example, Philip Deutlein in Munich uh, uh, sort of are, on the, uh, are along these lines and I mean, have achieved, I mean, some, they have seen some of these effects here, the back action of nanomechanics on atoms and, and vice versa. But I think that the question is really, you know, where do these things go? I mean, can we marry, for example, have a model with some of these things to get photons and stuff like that? Uh, but I don't have an answer at the moment, but it's something to be discussed in the workshop. Of course, there have been these ideas that uh, essentially always Misha Lukin based, you know, and we were uh, uh, collaborators in this context here. Um, the problem that I will talk about afterwards is some detail, as I mentioned before, or is often mechanical transducers. It's a way of doing quantum communications. And I see this as one kind of a prototypical example that we can use nanomechanics, sort of the setup that's shown over here, that we discuss later in really some detail, to achieve some goal that's sort of bigger than nanomechanics by itself, which is quantum communication, where at the very end you might have something like on chip devices to implement some of these ideas. And I find this very exciting to the extent that this really gives the whole thing kind of a bigger picture. And it seems that, you know, to some extent, some of these ideas are probably even uh, quite realistic, you know, based on the achievements one has now, for example, you know, when these conditions like cyclic cooling and all of these things, uh, between the cyclic cooling limit and so on. That's an optomechanical transducer. And there's also, also an uh, electromechanical uh, one, essentially the work by Peter Rabel over here together with Misha, uh, where one, you know, takes an array over here of nanomechanical oscillator, charges them up, and then gets not an optomechanical, but an electromechanical coupling over here. Uh, what one does here is really this, that one has, for example, the tip of a magnet over here that talks to an MD center. At the very end, one mimics something that's completely analogous to what we have in the context of, uh, of iron trap quantum computing. Uh, but I guess this doesn't really belong directly here to the conference because this is somehow essentially optonal mechanics. So these things down here is, is opto. Uh. Okay, so the people involved in this work here were uh, um, Kai Stanley and also Peter Rabel here. And of course, as I said, I really had this idea first by talking to Misha when he visited Munich now more than a year ago uh, after seeing the setup that um, uh, Tobias Kittenberg has in the lab. So I see this thing as a very interesting situation. And sort of as the last sort of, you know, idea slide here, there have been recent papers uh, about now a year ago where, for example, we have thought about cavity optonanomechanics using optically levitated nanospheres and uh, Ignacio Serac and collaborators have independently done something very similar. They talked about living organisms here. We talked about, uh, uh, about levitated nanospheres at the very end. I guess it's, it's very similar. And the question is somehow to do nanomechanics in a different way, which is much more atomic physics-like. That again, you have cavities, you trap particles over here, and then you can ask yourself, can you use the center of mass motion of these, uh, of these nanospheres, for example, as a nanomechanical oscillator that hopefully have, would have much less damping, you are decoupled much more from the environment here. And of course, some of these ideas are sort of related to what people have done also with cold atoms, like these experiments over here, where one takes a cloud of atoms. But of course, an atom is really different from the sphere. I mean, one is a solid and the other one is a, is a dilute gas. And so when it comes to center of mass, they are the same, but in terms of the excitations, of course, they are, they are quite different. So this is really a solid state system, but it's uh, sort of inheriting many of these properties from the, from the atomic side. 
So having sort of given you the, the tour of ideas, I mean, all of these things or many of these have not been done yet in the lab. Let me now move on and talk about two very specific things here. One is the optomechanical transducer for quantum communication. You know, that's the, the bigger goal outside of the community here that can be achieved here and then the free space interaction with atoms. Uh, I don't want to tell you the details here. I guess that this is a very interesting thing down here because for two reasons. It's an interesting noise problem, quantum noise problem for theorists. And sort of, you know, I'm asking the question, can we use these things and marry this with Hubble models? And I don't really have an answer for the second one. Um, now, both uh, of these problems over here turn out to be related to what we call in quantum optics cascaded quantum systems. Uh, this goes back, this notion, to Chris McGann and Howard Carmichael. Both of them wrote papers in the 19, in, in 94, uh, quite some time ago. Uh, but it turns out that this is the language to discuss these things. So I thought by, by telling you all of this, you know, I have to give you this, this bigger picture of all of that, I'll tell you a little bit about these cascaded optical systems here then sort of move on to discuss this thing as an application of, of this language. This is the language how we formulate these things. Okay, so the, the goal, as I said, is this bigger picture, is that uh, let's do quantum networks. And of course, in quantum networks, I mean, Jeff Kimball wrote this uh, very nice article down here some uh, time ago in Nature as an inside article. Uh, is this that you have nodes, you know, these nodes are connected by channels, and when we talk about, you know, physical implementation of something like this, this can be long distance communications, you know, can be done local distance communications where you have little quantum computers over here, some quantum memory, some qubits, and then you would like to wire them up by, uh, in this case here, using photons. So we have channels over here, and we have nodes, and uh, the purpose of the nodes is to store the quantum information and to do all of the local quantum processing. Atomic physics, we always thought about this, for example, as being iron trapped or something like that. And then you would like to interface these things. This is where the interface comes in, uh, the, uh, the optomechanical transducer. You'd like to interface these things with optics uh, to, to the channel, which is the photonic channel here. So in building this interface, this is really addressed in what we will do now afterwards. And uh, so this is the, uh, the quantum communication problem. And the question is, of course, how to do these things. So from a very you know, abstract point of view, uh, the basic building block in uh, building such kind of a quantum network is the following, that you have essentially a qubit over here, that is essentially a whole bunch of qubits that they often talk to each other by some entangling operations. And that these qubits, you know, they are some distance away, and let's assume for the moment that we have something like, like an optical fiber. So we have a continuum of nodes over here. And the question is now, can we build an interface, you know, which is indicated by these lines up here, where we uh, take this qubit and we map it on the flying qubit that goes over, and then by some magic, we have to find here some protocol, you know, so where we absorb this thing and sort of restore that. So we are doing long distance communication here via fiber. We have wave packet propagating, and uh, the goal for doing all of this is to achieve a transmission of the qubit, which is indicated out here. And uh, the question, of course, is how do we actually do that? I mean, uh, in physical implementation, that the interface, for example, some stationary qubit, which solid state qubit over here to something which is this optical fiber here. And uh, number two, of course, we find protocols because over here you have to, you know, establish something that you really absorb this thing and that it doesn't go out from the fiber here. So actually answers to some of these questions on the atomic physics side uh, were given in the paper a long time ago with Ignacio. And uh, I have to say that I think that, you know, what's written in the paper is definitely valid. And we'll have this word see that what we do now is sort of a reincarnation of the ideas of this paper, but of course in a completely different setting. On the atomic physics side, as I said, these ideas were valid, but they were extremely challenging. The challenge at the very end was this, that we assumed that we had atoms inside of cavities and actually, you know, trap single atoms reliably and uh, maybe even more important in a simple way inside of the cavity is sort of a big uh, problem. And this is the reason why, you know, people like Jeff Kimball and also Rente, for example, in Munich and many others have achieved single atom trapping, uh, but it is very hard. So to really make you know long distance communication and achieve this over here and over here is kind of a kind of a tough job. So the question is then on the solid state side, and uh, maybe at the very end is sort of simpler, also more scalable. You know, and so to have something like an on-chip device which provides such an interface, uh, with the very end the goal of uh, making this thing then uh, sort of uh, uh, part of the building block. You know, something that becomes then, uh, you know, an interface between the stationary qubits here, whatever they are, and then these flying qubits. And as I said before, you know, motivated by uh, the setup that uh, exists in Munich, Smith in Munich, um, he has given 
Schwarzwald's group. Sort of the basic idea that I will now expand on these things a little bit more is this, that you have uh, a qubit over here, for example. This can be a spin qubit, but you would like to map this thing, a spin qubit that maybe optically is not active, at the very end, you know, via the photons or something that, for example, can be a charge qubit. And uh, the basic idea is now to have the spin here, the spin qubit talks to mechanical as a mechanical resonator, and the mechanical resonator talks to some cavity, like uh, the form of the toroid indicated over here, the coupling, of course, being the usual radiation pressure coupling that we have. And at the very end, the hope is to find now this interface where this qubit is now converted to a photon going over here, and then you need, as I said before, this protocol where these things are stored over here. In the case of a charged qubit, for example, this nanomechanical oscillator, uh, it could be charged up, talks to the charged qubit here over here, whereas, for example, here it can be some uh, magnetic field that talks by a spin gradient, uh, which is moving, for example, the spin down here. Okay, so let me now go back, and this is sort of more like this uh, uh, taking old ideas, and these are really very old slides that we had now, uh, I guess, 14 years ago or something like that. Uh, what the idea was in the context of, of cavity QED, and then we will sort of you know, extract the basic ideas and then try to see to what extent they make actually more sense in a particular context here, uh, in the sense that they are maybe simpler. No, the idea then was actually very simple. You know, let's assume that we have a qubit inside of your cavity, and we call this your node one and here the node two, and uh, provided that we have, uh, say, atoms that have a ground state zero and one, you know, it is very clear that you know if I got the superposition over here, but let me assume for the moment that I'm in state zero. If I apply a laser over here, this laser doesn't touch the qubit, so nothing happens. We have this mapping over here. On the other hand, when you want to set a qubit, the idea was that well, if you have state number one over here, if you apply the laser, you can go up, but then a photon can be coherently emitted in the cavity, putting everything at this state zero. So you can see that one zero is sort of mapped now to zero plus the photon. Then the photon goes over. And so the question is how to be convinced this photon to enter the cavity and then be absorbed 100% by making a transfer back, achieving this mapping. And therefore, of course, we have achieved exactly the, the protocol that I mentioned before of this uh, state transfer, which is the, the basic building block of these quantum networks. Well, the answer for this protocol was actually the, the following physical intuition, and we will afterwards see the corresponding mathematics for this happen. You know, uh, the question is, how do we restore these things over here? Normally, when a wave packet that comes, you know, here, if your qubit was converted into a photon, flying photon, when it comes over here, will be reflected from the cavity. How do we avoid that? Well, the idea is now simply to simply shape the laser pulse over here, or shape the coupling, then we convert the qubit into the photon wave packet that goes out. And when we do that, uh, we would like to achieve, uh, we would like to tailor these laser pulses here in order to achieve the symmetric pulse that goes out. And why do we want to do that? We can see that, you know, we have here a cavity decay. I mean, this qubit over here was converted to a photon. And this thing, when it decays out, we want to achieve by our uh, coherent uh, laser pulse design, the symmetric wave packet. You can see that the decay process is, uh, you know, it should be equal to the time reverse of, uh, of the absorption process over here. So in other words, when I take a laser pulse over here, and I take the time reverse laser pulse over here, and this laser pulse is engineered to have the symmetric wave packet, then the decay of this photon from the wave from the cavity is the time inverse as the absorption process over here. So you can make an ansatz when you write your equations exactly of this type that you assume the time inverse pulses over here, and then try to find a solution. And indeed, this is also working then at the end of the nanomechanics. Now to relate these things to the description, as I said before, of uh, cascading quantum systems. In cascading quantum systems, we always have a problem that we have a source you know, over here, which is in a unidirectional way. Unidirectional is very important. It's driving uh, a, a second system. We call this a source and then a driven system. And as I said before, uh, Howard Kahn, actually, and Christian Garn have independently developed a formalism in quantum optics that allows one to describe these cascaded systems over here. Uh, actually, a very simple way, and it is the natural language to formulate all of these things. So I have a few slides telling you how this works, and then we will move on from there. Okay, so here's a few theory slides. Yeah? So what does it mean to have a cascading quantum uh, system? Uh, well, we have one system over here driving in a unidirectional way, another one here. And you can see that we have the Hamiltonian system 1, 2, plus the bus. This is the Hamiltonian of my fiber, the harmonic oscillator plus, plus some interaction. But look at the interaction down here. Interaction happens at two places. Interaction of this fiber that talks to the system happens here as well as over here. So when we write down our quantum optical coupling, we have here some system operator of the first system. We call it T1. That, for example, think of this as being a two-level system, where this is an operator that takes the two-level system down and 
creates a photon. This is the process over here of creating a photon, you know, that of course can now propagate along this fiber. And uh, this atom knows where it is because it is encoded in the position x1 over here. Now the second line is the same interaction except that everything happens over here and you can see what uh, instead of an operator C1, we are writing down an operator C2. So afterwards, this is the two little systems of qubits that will talk to each other, but they know, you know, which one is first and which one is second by x1 being smaller than the x2. Now, this uh, cascading quantum system that essentially is symbolic, you know, they rewrite the Schrödinger equation in an interaction picture by, you know, uh, essentially eliminating this HD over here and going to the interaction picture, it becomes a P dagger, there will be some exponentials over here, and these exponentials are then written, so to say, as little noiselets operators. Think of these P daggers as being quantum noiselets that create and destroy photons, and that would correspond in quantum optics to, to uh, quantum noise operators. And now you can see what the cascading quantum system means. It simply means that, for example, if an atom is over here and it's a photon, you know, this is this P dagger, then it will propagate along here, and at the later time, there's a time delay, you know, that encodes that this takes a certain time to come over here. There's a time delay where this uh, photon arrives at the second one, for example, it can then be absorbed. And this is exactly then what we want when we want to do, for example, our mapping of qubits. Uh, so for the experts in the audience, this would be a Radonovich equation with time delays in here. And the question is how to convert it to master equation. And uh, well, in quantum optics, we have some formalism for dealing with all of these things. And let me sort of jump to the bottom line and tell you what comes out and give you a very intuitive argument of what the corresponding equation is. Now, this equation is important because our ideas, you know, of uh, space protocols are essentially based on, on, on this equation here. So wh what do we mean by a master equation? Well, we have a qubit here, we have a qubit over here, we have some coupling that we are going to engineer afterwards, and then we have a base packet which is propagated over here. So when we talk about writing down a master equation, we mean a master equation for this or here, where essentially the fiber over here has been eliminated. So that's a master equation just involving the dynamics of these two qubits. So we have the four-dimensional Hilbert space, and this is our density matrix for all these. I guess it doesn't come much as a surprise that such a master equation must be of the Lindblad form and there will be quantum jump operators over here. And it turns out, let me now give you the argument, that the quantum jump operator is actually a collective quantum jump operator over here. So what does this quantum jump operator mean? Well, we can actually guess that it must be in this form based on the following. Uh, imagine that I do a fictitious experiment where I put a photo detector over here. You can see that if I want to do a transfer where I converted a qubit into a flying qubit, you know, if I see a count in the photo detector, the first thing is that, well, if I see a count, obviously my transfer failed because I didn't absorb it, so something went wrong. So if you see a click, something is wrong. But uh, what does a click in the photo detector actually mean in terms of the qubits over here? Well, a click in the photo detector means that a photon uh, has been emitted either here or here. We don't know which one it is. So in other words, you know, by not knowing that it came from here or here, this quantum jump operator associated with the click of this uh, photo detector here must be a superposition of the first atom having gone down and emitted the photon or the second one. And of course, it will be multiplied by some of these couplings and tell you, you know, what the probability for these processes is. So in this sense, we have sort of guessed right away what these unidirectional master equation quantum jump operators are. They are collective decay. So what about the effective Hamiltonians that we have over here? Effective Hamiltonian, well, I'm writing down here equation for my qubits, uh, there will be, you know, if you use standard uh, two-level atoms, there will be decay terms, because our qubits can sort of, you know, decay out here, emitting the photon. This is like Wiener Weisskopf, what we have over here. But the important point is now the second line that you can see down here. The second line is an, uh, is not a Hermitian operator. It is something where, you know, if, a, if the atom goes down over here, it spits out the photon, the photon propagates over here, there will be sort of a unidirectional Ping, uh, not a ping pong, but more like a ping process. You know, it always goes one way, and this is its process over here. This is the indication that we have the unidirectional coupling. Now, if one looks at this equation here, it's maybe not entirely obvious that this is indeed the Lindblad master equation, but we can actually rewrite this effective Hamiltonian to indicate that we have here a global decay, S dagger S over here. This is sort of the decay of the system. This amounts to the loss rate from the out channel over here. And then, of course, we have rewritten now the second line now you can see very beautifully that the second line now corresponds really to an interaction that emerges from all of this. Interaction is like sort of a dipole dipole interaction with a flip flop interaction, the spin sort of interchange like that, but that's exactly what achieves quantum transfer in such a network. So if I summarize that, we can say we have here decay, number one, and number two, we have the nice thing, this is what we want, 
interaction down here. Okay, so how do we cope now with the fact that we got decay over here? Well, if I want to achieve now transfer, my assumption is this, that I'm looking for a time-dependent dynamic to this network where my uh, density matrix that I have is always in the pure state. Normally, of course, if I solve the density matrix equation, this will not be the case, but you can see it will be the case provided that uh, these wave functions size satisfy the condition that you know the operator S, this was our global quantum jump operator acting on psi was equal to zero. Because if this is the case, then of course this term disappears and this term disappears and the only thing that remains is the interaction that we have down here. Now, the question is, well, we are writing down some conditions, can we satisfy them? And this is exactly where this intuition comes in, I mentioned before, namely if we have a laser pulse over here or some uh, pulse when we couple this thing in a time-dependent way, if you make the ansatz of solving this equation in this particular form, one actually finds certain pulse shapes uh, that achieve this condition and therefore it's a dark state and therefore this thing can be achieved over here. So that's the way of doing that. In the realistic situation, of course, there will be more noise terms to be added over here and of course they will destroy this idea and word that I'm talking about here. Yeah, so, so the level of the mass equation for the time of day is different from the condition. Uh, okay, you asked this question before, I remember that? That's right, and we talked about it. Uh, uh, you know, in this ideal world of having a unidirectional coupling, you can always introduce two times. One is laser, and the other one is actually dropped out. So, uh, the case here of refraction was first uh, uh, what, six years of refraction. Let's again talk about it afterwards. <laughs> whenever I see Christian Gardner and he talks about these things, he always comes and talks about it time to day. So, uh, I know it's important to talk about it. Okay, so uh, this is the ideal world. And this does state transfer, and this was the underlying theory. And the only thing that we need now is this, you know, what are these gammas that we have over here in this ideal world? Can we design them here so to achieve this kind of uh, transfer that we have here? And of course, it is at this point that this setup comes in by writing down now, of course, the Hamiltonian that corresponds now in detail how this spin over here, or uh, charge qubit, you know, is converted via non-mechanical couplings and over here, pressure coupling, and then at the end spits out the photon that according to our assumption, propagates in a unidirectional way out here uh, to the other side. Well, and this is the standard Hamiltonian that all of you know, having qubits, and then we have, of course, here, you know, uh, this part over here called nanomechanics, uh, and then, you know, nanomechanics oscillator talks, for example, with the qubit by having some sort of interaction. And then, of course, in the usual form, we have in the second line down here, a Hamiltonian for the cavity, therefore the usual uh, radiation pressure coupling here, Plus, we drive in an external field, and of course, as always in this uh, whole story, you do it in such a way that at the very end, you absorb this thing here, enhancing the corresponding coupling over here to make this thing appreciable, giving at the end, of course, a quadratic Hamiltonian. So these things essentially come, become a chain of, of coupling harmonic oscillators. But in doing all of that, of course, the question is now, you know, this is sort of this whole picture here is how cool of a system. We have this optimal mechanical transducer that at the end sort of is supposed to spit out the photon over here, converting the qubit over well, what's the corresponding coupling? You can see down here the chain of all of these couplings. This is the qubit. There will first of all be a lambda coupling. This is how the qubit talks to the nanomechanical oscillator. And then the oscillator itself, of course, talks to the cavity. G is now the coupling that includes now the striving field. And then, of course, at the very end, the photon uh, drops out. So what's the rate for this block that we have over here? This is the effective decay rate you know, of the qubit out to the fiber that converts the qubit at the end to the photon. Well, it's very clear that it must be of this type over here that we have a G square kappa, you know, this is the loss rate over here, uh, depending if you're in the strong or in the weak coupling limit. And uh, this is sort of elaborated more on here. You know, the total decay rate of the qubit, you know, will essentially be something like, you know, there will be this lambda that couples the qubit to the nanomechanical oscillator. And at the very end, you have to look at the decay. There will be two examples, uh, two cases over here, namely the one where either you are in the strong coupling limit of the cavity to the nanomechanical oscillator right, where you get the small splitting or you're in the weak uh, splitting down here. Actually, this is important, this curve over here, because by taking, for example, a certain time dependence in the external field here, you can actually make the G as a function of G time dependent. So at the very end of the day, that this G of G becomes time dependent here. This picture that I'm presenting here is valid in the rotating wave approximation, but sort of this is a little bit of interest anyway. You know, here's again this picture that we go out here. And then, of course, this is the two cases of the weak coupling. The G is very small, so this nanomechanical oscillator decays essentially like the G squared divided by kappa. 
As I said, we have here time to tell and control this thing. Well, at this point, of course, you sort of go back to what I said before by now asking, you know, what are these laser pulses or these uh, pulses that we put in in order to make these two and three tiny bennets? Of course, this and this is the inverse of this thing over here. And then you find that these things can be solved analytically. And indeed, you find that, you know, you get the complete transfer of it up here, modulo to some uh, imperfections that are going on. Okay, so what about noise? I mean, you know, at the very end of the day, if you need uh, the, uh, there will be, of course, thermal noise in your non-mechanical oscillator, which you want to be small. So there will be heating terms in the master equation. And there will be essentially two contributions coming in. One is the thermal noise, uh, and the other one is sort of the, 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 the Stokes heating, which is non-rotating wave terms that come in here. We always want, you know, the phonon to be converted to a, to a photon but we don't want terms, for example, of the type which are written over here uh, that, that would violate us. And they, of course, cause the crash. And it turns out, if you want this heating to be small, the condition, you know, for this uh, perfect term is this, that n is much less than one, and essentially these are the conditions for ground state cooling. And so to the extent one is able to realize conditions for ground state cooling, you know, the noise in such a transfer actually could be small. Okay, here's some numbers that uh, maybe I don't want to go in. So the claim at the very end is that, you know, if you don't look at thin and charged qubits in terms of these numbers, you can achieve fidelities with these numbers that are probably uh, somehow realistic of the order of something like maybe 90%. One would like, of course, to go higher, but always in the theory depends on your level of optimism what you put in here. But achieving 90% for the transfer actually would actually be uh, quite significant. <coughs> okay. Uh, so in this sense, let me conclude this part of my talk here by simply saying that there's, of course, other setups. I've looked at the one where we have an optical fiber that has a continuum of mode that goes through. But if you wanted to use these also mechanical transducer ideas, uh, you can also use them in a much more local context by having maybe a fiber that is cut off, so it becomes much more like a cavity. And then one would be here in the limit, where again, you can look at the optical mechanical transducer, but now talk to, for example, in the extreme case, to a to then it becomes a cavity QED problem and no longer, you know, what we had before, this uh, idea of a cascaded quantum network where really wave packets propagate and at the end can sort of leak out. I mean, here the wave packet would kind of, you know, propagate many uh, bounded uh, back and forth. And, of course, an extension of all of these things that I also don't want to enter now in detail is the question, I mean, how do these uh, things scale up? And uh, I find it actually quite interesting that, I mean, th there's a question, of course, of how do the noises, you know, add up in this whole thing, that's, uh, that's one issue. But another question that I found very interesting is this, that um, uh, Kai Steinig has done some calculation recently where he takes a whole, uh, you know, cascaded system like this, you know, coupled many here, and depending on what kind of coupling he assumes over here in terms of Hamiltonian here, he's, for example, able to find that in such a, uh, a line over here, you know, you can have, for example, the formation of singlet forming over here, so there will be product of singlet forming. And the question is, you know, in a more general context, can you actually design the whole process here to the appropriate Hamiltonian that you get actually interesting entangled states that you build up along these lines? Of course, all of these ideas always depend on this unidirectional coupling, which is, uh, you know, assumed to be perfect here, but in reality, of course, you know, this is a division of source noise. Okay, so let me now use the remaining time that I have. Uh, you know, briefly talk about this system down here of free space interactions. Uh, and as I said before, I'm telling you these things because of, of two reasons. Uh, number one, uh, actually, I mean, as a, putting on my head as a theorist, I find this a very interesting noise problem, uh, as we'll see in a moment, which is you know a beautiful application of these cascaded quantum optical system ideas. Um, but uh, second, uh, of course, the question I was always asking myself, and I've so far really come up with a good idea, is this, that we have all of these worlds of Hubbard models. I mean, uh, can we couple, for example, not only oscillating atoms, that would be the following, to these wells here, which is thanks to old days of laser cooling, uh, to something, to a, a, to a non mechanical oscillator, but can we also do this for Hubbard models? And can we engineer why are these things here, for example, some long range interactions? I don't really have an answer, but maybe some people around here want to. Okay, so what is the work that we did along these lines? And as I said before, uh, 
this is work done together with Clay and Tamara, essentially, you know, to try and study this by integrating the sound system. And on the experimental side, it was uh, Philip Deutlein who participated in this because, I mean, he has an experimental setup that uh, can look and has been looking at some of the effects of, uh, of atomic motion over here of an atomic ensemble on the mirror and, and also vice versa. So uh, let me first of all put these things in a little bit more general context. Um, you know, as I said before, all of you know, atoms in optical lattices, this is basic standard setup which is the thing. So the standard setup has a fixed mirror. Hopefully there's no noise because the noise will bring these things around and there will be heating of the atoms. But we will have atoms in the optical lattice over here. And what is usually interested in a quantum motion over here. So uh, there would be the limit of near resonant lattices where this is the world of laser cooling. Uh, where you have atoms oscillating over here. This is the old days of laser cooling, maybe now about 15 or even more years ago. In far resonant lattices where dissipation is very small and this is the world of covered models. And then of course you can see that another ingredient in this whole story is the laser. And then we talk about these things here. You know, this, the laser enters in a very trivial way. It only serves to make us a classical lattice potential, uh, which is of course given by the laser, the dipole force. And we have uh, maybe a mission of a photon that enters as decoherence. We have recently written papers about decoherence in these Hubble models over here. Uh, uh, but this is sort of the standard setup. Well, uh, when we say that, you know, laser, the laser acts as a classical field, sort of a stipulated driving field here, uh, what we have is, of course, that uh, in the old days, uh, you know, of the experiments of laser cooling, actually the back action, you know, of the motion of atoms over here was, uh, was observed in the following sense. You know, there was an experiment, and I remember that actually our German here, yeah, Meister, wrote a paper about this thing of counter propagating uh, beams, and then we had, we had atoms oscillating. You know, an atom is taking, of course, photons out of these light beams, you know, like that. And as a consequence of all of these, there's a back action of these oscillations, provided they are sort of together, these optical lattices or these light beams by simply unbalancing them. And in the early days of laser cooling, this was indeed seen, but this was very close to near resonance lattices. But now we actually want to look at the other case of being far off resonance, and uh, we also want to bring in our first quantum motion to mirror that we have over here. So um, a little bit more complicated situation is the one where you put a membrane over here where you also have partial reflection. This makes the problem here uh, more complicated. First of all, I mean, this is assuming now uh, a micro mirror or a membrane that we have over here. And now, of course, this becomes a quantum degree of freedom, and the consequence will be that this radiation field will be shaking around, and uh, the, the challenge is sort of to describe now these composite dynamics of atoms, for example, oscillating in this lattice over here, coupled to the motion of the nano mechanical mirror or membrane that you have over here. But now the light that before was, uh, you know, simply a classical driving field, it turns out we have to do a proper quantum description of this because it's really emission of photons between this and this thing over here, you know, the exchange of photons, which is mediating the corresponding interaction. So at the end, you will see that we will get something like a cascaded quantum system out, but in a more complicated form than we had before. Okay, uh, so let me first of all just give you a very briefly the naive and very, very obvious picture. And it actually turns out that this picture, while it gives some of the things right, actually <coughs> fails in some important aspects and that we have to do quantum. No, uh, sort of the, the classical, sort of the very intuitive picture by taking a classical light field would be this, that if I got the motion of the membrane over here, what will simply happen is that my lattice is shaking back and forth, and my lattice potential seen by some atom J over here will simply be, you know, the displacement, because this is simply changing my boundary condition, and you get the coupling over here, which at the end, if you got many atoms, will of course couple to the center of mass motion of all of these atoms, uh, something which is quite obvious. Now the sad thing about this, if you work it out, is that this coupling G naught that we have over here, you know, when we have the standard radiation pressure coupling, this would be the optical frequency, and here is, of course, this very tiny frequency of just the oscillation inside of the lattice. You can see at this point, we are paying a very hefty price. It is very clear that the normal radiation pressure coupling is much larger than what we have here. And of course, if you see a multiplied uh, by this uh, small number again, which is the nanomechanical uh, zero point oscillation amplitude, so the centimeters divided by the distance, you know, the localization of an atom in an optical lattice. If you put all of these things in, you can see that the mass ratio enters the rigid center to minus seven. So at this point, you conclude that this is equal to zero, except for the fact, of course, that we have this sum over here that puts the number of atoms back. So at the very end, one is able, by looking at the center of mass motion, to get a coupling which is multiplied by the pairs of number of atoms over here. 
And indeed, if we take something like an old typical ensemble that you have a laser pooling like uh, with eight, eight particles, then these things can become of the order of kilohertz. So the question, the statement is this, it seems from this very naive argument, there's a coupling here of the order of, uh, of kilohertz, which, you know, in relation to the damping time that one has in the planet over here, it's actually, you know, one is able to go in principle to the limit that this is larger than, than the relevant damping. But actually, this picture here is a little bit incomplete, and if one takes this literally, you know, these simply these elastical screens that are shifted around, one is easily able to find out configurations here that uh, turn out to be obviously physically wrong. And uh, let me now give you the, the quantum picture of this whole thing, where actually the field has to be quantized, and there will be little noise labs, sort of, you know, photons being exchanged between these two, and they, of course, amount to, at the very end, inducing this uh, interaction over here, plus also then, of course, there will be so what's the picture behind? So let me just uh, go over these things here briefly. And uh, so uh, if I write down a Hamiltonian for this complete system, the Hamiltonian will have the following type. First of all, we have the Hamiltonian for this nano mechanical oscillator with the switch over here, the neutral force. Then I got some atoms over here. And these atoms, of course, have kinetic energy. But these atoms will also sit here in the, in the potential, in the optical potential created by an incident laser field that comes over here. But now we are more careful and write this thing here as a stark shift. This is dipole potential. But E plus and E minus, this is just a dipole potential, but now in a, in a quantum form. And of course, so this is dipole potential here. And then in the last line down here, uh, what we have is this. This is the radiation pressure term on this membrane that we have. So there will be light coming from the left, light coming from the right, taking the difference of these pointing vectors. You know, the displacement over here, this is the coupling that we have the radiation pressure on the on the on the membrane here. Simply intensity from the left minus intensity from the right. Well at that point of course you know this is a fully quantum mechanical model. You put in now for example the incident light field is a coherent light field and then you start to write down these equations and actually you can simplify them enormously because you know the laser light will be dominant and you can really linearize all of these things that you have down here around the, the, the laser light. You know the zero order the laser light gives you the static potential and then you would like in a sort of a quadratic approximation work out what all of these different contributions are. Um, well, at that point, of course, you know, introduce all of these modes. There will be light modes, you know, coming from the right, which will be reflected and go through. And there will be light modes, you know, which is not driven from the left, which is reflected and also goes through, you know, around all of these modes you can analyze. Let me sort of, you know, jump to the conclusion and sort of give you the, the, the punchline, you know, of what, uh, uh, of what all of these things um, actually mean. You know, and the way that I would like to explain this physics is by writing down again the quantum stochastic Schrodinger equation with time delays. You might say, tell me this is complete overkill, but you can see that there's a very nice physical picture emerging from all of these things. Well, the first thing that, you know, uh, is that we have done here, as you can see, that we have introduced noise lapse operator BR and BR dagger that are sort of creation and destruction operators. You know, for the mode which comes in here from plus infinity that corresponds to the, these modes. And let me at the moment assume that we have an ideal mirror over here. Now, you can see that uh, when I have some light that comes in, you know, when I got atoms, for example, these atoms are oscillating. As I said before, they simply unbalance these light beams. And when they unbalance the light beams, it simply means, of course, that the intensity will be fluctuating. But that's exactly what's written in the first term. When the atoms are moving, and they are moving at the oscillation frequency, of these little oscillator wells in my lattice, they will couple to the intensity fluctuations of the light. And so this is a quadrature component that corresponds to the intensity fluctuations. Now, what about the mirror down here? You can see the mirror, the motion of the mirror, will couple not these things up here to this minus, but to the one with the plus. They are coupled to the phase, because they simply shifted the phase around here. And of course, there's another term down here, you know, which is, uh, again, the atom. Now you can see that there are time arguments that we have up here. And actually, the way to read it is like this. If a laser comes in here, of course, these atoms will be oscillating. You know? In other words, these atoms, you know, the laser beam will be uh, modulated by essentially sidebands that, uh, that mimic the atomic motion. This is the part over here. So we got incident laser beam. Now the motion of the atom puts on sidebands. At a later time, which is the one in the middle, they hit the mirror. You know, at an even later time, you know, this, uh, this, this ideal mirror here can again put on sidebands. These things are going back. They can interact with the atom again. So you can now sort of play ping pong between all of these different photon emissions that correspond to these interactions here and get your effective interactions and oligodynamics out. 
So the key elements are that we have the atomic motion unbalanced with the laser beam. The mirror motion makes the phase modulation. And then, of course, we have here the time delays that incorporate now all these proper retardation and causality and all of that. And sort of this is, again, uh, kind of the picture here, you know, that indicates all of these different noise sets, you know, for these different curves that are up here, like this intensity fluctuation of unbalancing here in the direction of the mirror. And all of them sort of put sidebands on the incident laser beam. So this is our, our quantum degree of freedom. And if you include now, you know, also the other modes, you get here both terms, you can see that if you have a left coming mode, which is not driven, you know, you only have that the mirror talks to the atoms, but not the other way around. So there's an asymmetry in the problem. You know, the mirror talks to the atom, but the atom along this mode will not talk back. And this causes actually an interesting asymmetry in the problem. Well, at that point, you can again start to write down uh, your, your laser, uh, your master equations and so on. And I guess I don't want to keep this in our details because I'm running over time. Let me just tell you that if you are interested in this whole thing, you know, there's even, this is probably the most inefficient way to do uh, laser cooling of a membrane by using a bunch of atoms that's far away. I find it very interesting that at the end the numbers goes out that you actually can even cool very close to the ground state. But the really interesting problem for me is actually this one. You know, when I look at all of these equations, can I sort of engineer interesting Hubbard models maybe to this kind of a setup that mimic now photons and there, of course, the light now becomes a quantum degree of freedom. So to marry these things with the many body physics that we know in the context of, uh, of Hubble models. Now this brings me to the conclusion. Let me sort of summarize. I know I talked about two things. The main part of my talk was about these quantum networks that I feel would be a beautiful application for, for optical nanomechanics. And uh, then there was this question, you know, that's maybe a little bit more one of my hobbies. I would like to you know, understand to marry sort of nanomechanics, maybe with Hubbard model or cold atom ideas. These couplings are very small, but uh, maybe at the very end, this can be a very interesting sort of a design tool to add to interactions, for example, on the atomic side that are you know, global interactions. Maybe very much like the case that we have in cavity QED, and we couple these things with uh, cavity QED photons, and here would be sort of a formal version. But that's a question mark, as I said. But of course, in contrast to these things, when we do high Q cavity, where we can even talk about a single atom coupled to a membrane, but all of these numbers go 